Today on Fire 180, we're going to be discussing the Shroud of Turin. Could this be the burial cloth of Jesus? In addition, today we have an interview with someone who may have seen the face of the Shroud in 3D like nobody ever has. Welcome to Fire 180, where we discuss faith and reason, we connect hearts and minds, and change attitudes 180 degrees. Today on Fire 180, we're going to be discussing the Shroud of Turin, which is a finely woven linen cloth which has the image of a crucified man, which millions believe to be Jesus of Nazareth. But is it? Or is it a medieval hoax? The shroud is the single most studied artifact in human history, and modern science has completed hundreds of thousands of hours studying it. But yet, what scientists have discovered is both baffling and shocking. As I said, there has been an enormous amount of research done in the Shroud of Turin, but in today's video, I'm going to keep it to a summary of most of the fascinating characteristics because this video could be easily two hours long. So later, I'm going to share with you a list of resources that you can go to further your study and investigation into the Shroud secrets. In addition, we have an interview with Jim Henman, a Juno Hall of Fame member for his involvement in co-founding the Canadian Hall of Fame rock band April Wine, and his unique discovery of the Shroud's three-dimensional properties. As well, at the end of this video, I'm going to share with you an image of a face computer created by Emmy winner 3D computer graphics artist Ray Downing. His work was published as a documentary on the History Channel entitled The Real Face of Jesus. So let's dive in. So what is a shroud? It's a piece of cloth most often used to wrap a dead body for burial. They've been used for thousands of years and in turn, Italy, there's a mysterious one with a faint image of a bearded, crucified man located in the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist encased in bulletproof glass. The shroud is approximately 14 feet long and three and a half feet wide, precisely in ancient measurements, two by eight cubits, bearing a front and back image of a crucified man, approximately five foot 10 tall. It's been venerated as the burial cloth of Jesus since at least the 14th century until Secunda Pia, an Italian lawyer and amateur photographer, took photos of the shroud. And when he was developing the pictures, what he discovered sent shockwaves around the world. The negative image showing incredible detail of what appeared to be evidence of the crucifixion of Jesus written about in the Gospels. In 1978, a team of scientists called the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or STIRP, was given permission to conduct an extensive scientific examination of the Shroud. They spent two years preparing and planning dozens of experiments with the goal of determining what the scientific properties of the image are and what caused it. Their findings were overwhelming and confusing to even them. Barry Schwartz, a non-Christian, was the official documenting photographer for STIRP. He compares the shroud to a forensic crime scene with scientific accuracy, verifying the details written in the Gospels. So what exactly do we know about this crime scene and who is the man of the shroud? Based on the Gospel accounts, there were two burial cloths, one for Jesus' body and the other for his face. Today, we're gonna to look at both. First, the main cloth referred to as the shroud. Along with the appearance of a crucified man, there are burn marks from a fire in 1532, as well as water stains from when trying to save the shroud and patches that were sewn on to repair the shroud. The scourge marks on the man are on both his front and his backsides, most being on his back going down his legs. According to experts, they were made with a multi-thonged, lead-weighted Roman whip called a flagrum, ingeniously designed to tear flesh apart and inflict some serious punishment. When examining the shroud, along with the flagrum, they match up identically. There are over 120 scourge marks visible on the man's body. Next are the nail wounds on his hands and even on the backside of his foot that you can see an exit wound from a nail where blood is trailing off. On the left hand side, there's a wound in the chest consistent with the Gospel's account of a Roman lance being thrust into Jesus' side. The laceration even has the same dimensions of a Roman spear. This would fulfill the prophecy that was made about the coming Messiah, which he would be pierced and not a single bone would be broken, which is what they would do often to crucified victims 
they would break their knees so they couldn't push up with their legs to take a breath resulting in quick suffocation. In addition, the side wound is between the fifth and sixth rib where it would have punctured both the lung and the lower part of his heart, explaining the Bible's account that immediately after piercing Jesus, water and blood sprayed out. Also on the man's head, blood stains are visible on both the front and back sides, which are consistent to the gospel's account of a crown of thorns being placed on Jesus' head. It's no wonder that the word excruciating comes from the Latin word to crucify, and no one mastered crucifixion, innovation, and genius like the Romans. A device called the VP-8 Image Analyzer, which was designed by NASA, used in space imagery by Voyager and other space missions, was used on the shroud. They discovered that it is the only two-dimensional image in the world that can produce a 3D detailed image such as this, as if someone hid a blueprint of unique coding within the shroud. More on that later in my interview with Jim Henman. It is written in the Gospels that Jesus' body was wrapped in a fine linen cloth provided by a wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea, which is consistent of the Shroud of Turin. As a matter of fact, it's a finer burial cloth than what Cleopatra was wrapped in, indicating that whoever this man is was a very special person to whoever buried him. Max Fry, a Swiss criminologist, was able to remove 58 samples of pollen from the Shroud. He was able to determine that the majority of the pollen found was from Jerusalem and surrounding areas, further refuting that this is a medieval European cloth. The blood on the shroud are from a human male, type AB. And according to Dr. Alan Adler, a blood chemist and expert, he says that old blood stains turn black or brown. However, the blood on the shroud is red. He says that this occurs when the body releases high counts of bilirubin into the bloodstream, which is produced when someone is tortured and beaten and given no water. Their body goes into shock and releases these high levels of bilirubin into the bloodstream. There have been a number of theories about the image that was created on the shroud. One, that it was a medieval painting. However, science has proven that there is no paint or pigments on the cloth. Another theory was that it was some form of mysterious photography. However, someone would have had to have had an immense understanding of 20th century negative imagery centuries before photography was even invented. So how old is the Shroud of Turin? Here's what many scholars believe, which I'll add links to in the video description below in this video. The Shroud makes its journey beginning in Jerusalem in the first century and is moved to Turkey, remaining in Constantinople until 1204. Then it was discovered in France in 1353 and then moved to Turin in 1578 where it remains today. In 1988, the shroud was carbon dated and the results showed that it was between the 13th and 14th century. The very odd thing about this though is that they agreed prior to to take three samples from three different areas of the shroud, but that's not what they did. For some unknown reason, they took all three samples from the same outside corner where repairs had been made to repair the cloth. Ray Rogers, a thermal chemist from Los Alamos Laboratory, has over 50 peer-reviewed articles. He obtained a thread sample from the edge area where the carbon dating samples came from, and then he compared it to the main body cloth. Even to his surprise, the findings were shocking. They were not the same. He found that there was cotton twisted in the corner of the sample where the repairs had been made and none anywhere else in the main body. Therefore, they're not representative of the main shroud. Before his death, Rogers published his last paper of his career. In his expert opinion, he said that this was the worst area to take samples for carbon dating and could not possibly represent the shroud's origin. The cotton fibers are coated with gums and dyes, but yet the main cloth has zero evidence of dyes and gums making the carbon dating results either disingenuous or, at best, misleading. Ross Brio is a prominent researcher and lecturer on the Shroud of Turin for over 30 years. His presentations are like a CSI investigation. He says that the statistical probability of the Shroud of Turin being anybody other than the historic Jesus is millions to one. Barry Schwartz, the official Sturp photographer, concludes it best as a Jew and not a Christian. He says, quote, I believe the Shroud of Turin is the cloth that wrapped the man Jesus after he was crucified. That is not meant as a religious statement. 
but one based on my privileged position of direct involvement with many of the serious shroud researchers in the world and a thorough knowledge of the scientific data, unclouded by media exaggeration and hype. The only reason I am still involved with the Shroud of Turn is because knowing the unbiased facts continues to convince me of its authenticity. This brings us to the second cloth, which is mentioned in the Gospel as being folded and put aside. The Sudarium in Oviedo, Spain, is widely believed to be that cloth that was used to cover the face of Jesus. The Sudarium of Oviedo is approximately 20 inches by 30 inches and like the shroud has type AB blood. Both have pollen from Jerusalem and when overlaid many experts believe that it is in fact beyond any reasonable doubt that the shroud of Turn and the Sudarium of Oviedo once covered the face of the same man. The history of the Sudarium is well documented and much more straightforward than that of the Shroud. Most of the information comes from the 12th century and according to this history the Sudarium was in the Israeli Jordanian region until shortly before the year 614 when Jerusalem was attacked and conquered by Persia. It was taken to avoid destruction in the invasion and landed in Spain where it still resides. And since 1113 the chest holding the Sudarium has been kept in the cathedral at Oviedo in Spain. There was an investigation into the sudarium by a team of experts. They found that the stains on the cloth show that when it was placed on the dead man's face from the composition of the stains it's evident that the man died in an upright position. In 1994, an international event was held in Oviedo, at which time Dr. Fry's research regarding pollen was also confirmed on the face cloth. Also residues of what is most probably myrrh and aloe, which is also mentioned directly in the Gospel of John regarding Nicodemus. The fascinating evidence is when the sudarium is compared to the Shroud of Turin. The first is that the blood on both cloths are both AB, and the length of the nose on the sudarium has been calculated at just over three inches, which is the same length as the nose on the image on the shroud. There's a small stain visible coming from the right side of the man's mouth on both the shroud and the sudarium. Dr. Alan Wagner, a Duke University professor, applied a polarized image overlay to the sudarium, comparing it to the image of the blood stains on the shroud. The results showed 70 points of coincidence with the shroud. He concluded that the only possible explanation was that the sudarium covered the same face as the man in the Shroud of Turn. I mentioned in the beginning of this video an interview which I recently had the honor of having with Juno Award winner Jim Henman, which he shares a fascinating discovery that he made regarding the Shroud of Turn's three-dimensional properties. I'm excited today to introduce you a friend of mine, Jim Henman, who is a member of the Juno Hall of Fame for being a founder of the 70s band April Wine. Jim has a passion that's second to none for the Shroud of Turn, and I'm excited to be able to ask Jim some questions today about the Shroud. So Jim, what was it about the Shroud that created this passion that you have for it? Well, I guess it goes back to like 1980, I think, Dave. I was, uh, as I say, I was working in the lab one night. <laughs> no, I was, I was in the lab. <laughs> and uh, I saw, somebody had left the scientific journal uh, an 80s, 81, I don't know what it was, uh, uh, the magazine Scientific Journal, and uh, I was just browsing through it. I was on the night shift, and I saw the cover actually first was a picture of something I hadn't seen before, which was the face of the shroud of, uh, of, of Turin, the face of the man that's on that. And uh, I read the article, and they mentioned a study that had been done in the uh, mid to late 70s uh, over in, in Turin the, the church had given permission to a whole vast number of scientists led by Dr. Jackson uh, to go over there and basically spend a, a, a week or two I don't remember exactly how long it's been quite a while since I read the article uh, studying the whole cloth that they uh, suspected was the cloth that Jesus had been buried in after his crucifixion. And I had just gone through at that particular time uh, a, a kind of a spiritual awakening. I had been on a Crucio retreat, a couple of them actually, and you know it had led me in a whole different direction in my life. So this really interested me. So that that's what started it, my little journey with the Shroud. The, uh, the next step was to get the study, to get a copy of the study, and uh, when I read the study, 
they had used a computerized 3D enhancer when they examined this whole face and body of this image. It was a, the same computerized um, enhancer that they had used when they went to Jupiter and studied the mountains on Jupiter. They could, they could read through the uh, different gray zones, height. They could me measure height. And when they had examined the face of the shroud on the, the, with this instrument, they found that the face had a dimension to it. 3D dimension of, of some sort. So I said, ooh, this is interesting. So that's, that just kept me going. I actually uh, decided I'm going to try to do something. So I ran some, I ran some copies of the actual face that I had from the, the uh, scientific journal. I, I ran them through a, uh, a Xerox copier and I took them down by 10%, like 100%, 90%, 80%. And then I started working with little cardboard models and things. I, I oh gosh, it was my uh, my family must have thought I was a little wacko. <laughs> so Jim, you had this vision in your mind about the light and the dark and how it creates a three D vision. And so the part of your story was how you contacted some members of the Sturp team. Yes, I I had. Uh, as I said, I had gone and made some copies on a Xerox, but I wanted to get a little better quality to the photo, to the original photo. Because as you know, I, I, uh, Dave, is that the, in, in the 1880s, I believe it was, 1890s, in the early days of photography, a uh, amateur photographer had actually taken a picture of the shroud face, and when he developed it, he noticed that the negative, of his developed picture had much more characteristics to it than the positive. When you look at the actual shroud image, if we if we had the shroud here right now, it's very uh, almost like just faint images on the cloth. You don't really see any distinction of any sort. It's when you take the picture and then you see the negative where all these characteristics come out, the, the black and the white. So um, I wanted to get a, a better quality picture of this negative. And I was uh, sitting there one day and I just decided that I would go on my, my computer, my iMac there, and, and say, uh, look up uh, Dr. Jackson, Dr. John Jackson, Stirp study. So I called him and uh, told him who I was, what I was doing, and could he help me? He said, well, he said, yeah, Barry can help you with that. Well, Barry is Barry Swartz, who was the head photographer on that study and now is the authority on the shroud in the world. He has his site there and just an amazing amount of uh, research that he's done. And uh, so I, I got the phone number and I phoned Barry and I told Barry who I was. He answered, I, I told him who I was and uh, he said, no problem. I just have to, to sign, I have to get you to sign off on it, you know, so that you, you won't use it for commercial purposes. No problem, I said. So I did that and uh, within a very short time I had a, uh, the best quality of that negative that I could get, and that's what I that's what I work with now. That's what you have here. That's what we have here in the face. Here is those is um, the three D panels, the multi multi panels that that Barry sent me. But three four days ago, after you and I spoke uh, about this. I contacted Barry again to find out if he had a better quality one, and lo and behold, um, he he said yes, I do. Is that, yeah, there it is. There, that's that's the uh, the one that he sent me. I printed these off. That's the one he sent me. It has twice the data than this one, than the original that I worked with, and I've run them all off. Uh, uh, this is a, a ninety percent, and then there's an eighty percent. So Jim, so you you wanted to print off the various um, films in the light and darkness to, cre to create yeah, a better three dimensional three dimensional, image. Three -dimensional yeah. So this is this is the the uh, I believe this is ninety percent of the darkness is gone, as you can see. That's a hundred to this one. Yeah, compared to that one, I don't know if it'll show up on the camera right. or not. So what I do is I plot them. 
uh, about a quarter of it, uh, I guess it's 0 0.04 decimal, 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 you know, number, 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 inches apart. I still work in inches. <laughs> and and I put all, all of them in here. Uh, it works out to approximately four inches between the front of the nose and the back and the front of the ear here. That's so the, when you put these 100%, 90%, 80%, so on right down to 10 percent this creates this 3d very image. unique yeah. 3d image yeah, of the face of the shroud yes it, it's a, it's a it's a bit ghostly as you know david um the first time i looked at it uh, when i had put this together i was in my kitchen and uh, all the lights were out you need you do need a projection light behind it you know to to come through the image so you can see the different levels um so the first time I looked at it, I was sitting on a chair just like this in the kitchen, and I, I looked at it, and I, my mouth opened, and I just about fell off my chair. I was so excited and, and kind of freaked at the same time because it, I'd never seen anything like this. And I, uh, so I, I'm hoping that this new, uh, new one will even be a little more demonstrative, demonstrative of, this, of the 3D, 3D image in there. It's quite, it's quite amazing. It's remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Jim, what is it about the shroud and why is it important to you to want to share the message about the shroud of turn to others? Well, the shroud is, is a, a question mark, has a big question mark. And the question mark is, is it real? Um, is it valid or is it a... Uh, a painting or some kind of work done maybe 1300s something like that and uh, perhaps they'll never be able to answer that so it'll always have that question mark but I was my I, I wasn't I didn't do this to uh, to really uh, try to prove or disprove the, the the shroud as being authentic I was totally focused on the fact that this thing for some reason has 3d on it has a 3D like gray zones that can be interpreted this way on a very simple device, right? And uh, that's that's where my focus was. That this has 3D on it, and to me that was astounding in itself. That was a miracle in itself that it had that. Uh, where that goes from there, I don't know. Does that does that help someone uh, uh, research more of the shroud to find out whether or not it is a thing? There's been so much research done on this object that um, there must be books and books of, of interpretations on everything from the type of thread that was used to uh, the type of blood that's on it, which apparently there is blood on it. So I don't know. I, 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 try, I try to stay uh, neutral as far as, you know, whether the shroud, to me, neutral, not to you, but to me, uh, and whether or not the shroud is authentic. I think this is authentic. This phenomena that that is there is authentic. Whatever is causing it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a phenomenon. It is it's a phenomena, and it's authentic. It, it's represented as here in this this little uh, display, this uh, 3D multi-panel display. As that's, uh, I didn't know what to call it. That's what uh, Barry told me it is. Barry Swartz said that's a 3D. <laughs> multi-panel display. I said, well, he dirty. seems to be an expert he in photography, expert. so yeah. if he wants to call it that, that's what we will call that's it. That's what we'll call it, yeah. yeah. I know this is authentic because I did it. I made it. I produced it with, uh, with the information that is on the shroud, which is quite fascinating. I don't know if they'll ever be able to cancel that question mark you know, of authenticity. Yeah, don't know. Wow. Yeah, it comes down to faith, doesn't it? You know, uh, it it does. I must add, it does strengthen my faith somewhat in that there's even a possibility that this could be the cloth that Jesus was wrapped in after his crucifixion, and if it was the only rational. It's a strange word to use, but the only rational th thought that comes to me is that it was the resurrection that did this to the cloth. Uh, just thinking, 
of what phenomena would create this on the cloth, this image of a, of a person's body. It had to be a, a most unusual event, most unusual, and maybe once in, uh, maybe the first time. And maybe so. <laughs> and maybe so. And maybe the only time. And maybe the only time in this in this particular way. Wow. Yeah. Well, Jim, thank you so much for your passion and for allowing the world to be able to see what a three-dimensional image of Jesus' face is using this 3D plane display. So thank you very much, Jim. You're welcome, Brad. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to show you this and whoever else is watching. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. So what could have produced the image and characteristics of the Shroud of Turin? Well, after years of study, Sturp issued its final report in 1981 and made the final conclusion. I'm going to link in the description where you can read the entire conclusion, but I'm going to give you somewhat of a summary of it. Quote, no pigments, paints, dyes, or stains have been found on the fibrils. Ultraviolet and infrared evaluation confirm these studies. It is clear that there has been a direct contact of the shroud with a body, which explains certain features such as scourge marks as well as blood. For an adequate explanation for the image on the shroud, one must have an explanation which is scientifically sound from a physical, chemical, and biological and medical viewpoint. At the present, this type of solution does not appear to be obtainable by the best efforts of the members of the shroud team. Thus, the answer to the question of how the image was produced or what produced the image remains now and, as it has in the past, a mystery. So to continue your research and for scholarly sources into both the Shroud of Turin and the Sudarium of Oviedo, I'm going to provide you a few suggestions. First and foremost is Shroud.com, where you will find an incredible list of links to scientific papers and imagery of over 300 pictures taken by Barry Schwartz, the official documenting photographer for the Shroud Research Project. He has been interviewed in numerous television programs as well as many other documentaries, as well as the Turn Shroud Center of Colorado, together with his wife Rebecca, Dr. John Jackson, who led the scientific team in 1978, founded this center for study on the Shroud. Also, the Magi Center founder and President Father Robert Spitzer. He has appeared and made numerous TV appearances. And finally, ShroudEncounter.com, founded by Russ Brio, mentioned earlier in this video, and many other sources and video links will be in the description of this video below. As I mentioned earlier, Emmy winner 3D computer graphics artist Ray Downing used his skills along with the information on the Shroud of Turn with the latest technology to create a computerized image of what the face on the man in the Shroud could possibly be. Could this actually be the true face of Jesus? So that's the Shroud of Turn, the most studied and mysterious object in history. Is it the burial cloth of Jesus? In the end, with all the evidence, the question that I believe that we are all being asked by the man in the shroud is simply, who do you say that I am? If you've enjoyed today's video and would like more people to see this, then please hit the thumbs up button and the subscribe button below and the notification bell. And with YouTube's algorithms, more people will see it. Thank you very much. God bless.